I can tell you, Kiko, that there were, um, there were a lot of us that gathered together at Kennedy Space Center to, to watch that flight, and we were all cheering you on as you caught um, that first yeah, super heavy. It's like heavy. catching a sky skyscraper <laughs> with chopsticks, you know? You guys ever done that? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hard. Uh, but we thought it was crazy, too, at the time, you know, um, when, when Elon pushed us and we are like, eh, I don't know about this. But um, he's got a way sometimes of pushing us to do things and, and pushing us outside the envelope. And, and the way to think about Razor, like Falcon 9 launches and then lands on a drone ship, sometimes it comes back to land. But that's not like an airplane. An airplane launches and takes, or takes off and lands in, on the same runway, right? And so if we have to land in a different place from the launch pad, then we're not truly going to become aircraft-like, right? So the reason we build an architecture where you end up landing in the same place you launch from is like that is how you create a reusable system. Why is reusability important? That's how you drastically reduce the cost of access to space and then increase the amount of payload you can take to orbit. And you know, if you look through the history of time, every time civilization figures out a way to move goods and people at a drastically reduced amount of money or a drastically reduced amount of effort, huge leaps in civilization happen, right? Think about Oregon Trail. It used to be a pain in the butt to go to the West Coast. Build a railroad, all of a sudden go, you know, the, the, the California boom, right? Um, you look at the interstate highways. Uh, you look at going from, from sail ships to steamships, right? Uh, even the Silk Road, if you think way back. So when humans figure out how to move things easier and cheaper, we generally prosper. Um, and now, it, look, it's not all positive. Sometimes there's negatives, but the, generally the, the positives outweigh the negatives. Um, and society becomes better for it. And that's why we're building Starship, is to create a truly rapidly reusable, launch, fully rapidly reusable launch vehicle. Because if we're able to reduce that barrier to entry, reduce the cost, really, and the thing we're optimizing is cost per ton to the surface of Mars, um, we're going to com completely create an entirely new economy that a lot of people have, we haven't even dreamed of yet. Uh, and I think humans, society, and Earth would be better for it. So uh, the bulk of the development of Starship is happening in South Texas, in Brownsville, Texas. Uh, we have a town called Starbase there. The first really ever orbital uh, commercial spaceport is there. Um, that's where all of our test flights have happened, uh, just the ship test flights and now our orbital test flights. Um, but as we stabilize that rocket, we're going to operationalize it, and we're going to bring it to Florida. So we're working on two separate environmental statements, sort of huge um, environmental studies, both at KSC for using Starship out of 39A and on the Space Force side at 37, which is the form of Delta Heavy Pad. Um, so we've gone through a very lengthy process. It's actually been, you know, there's some thought like we're just kind of rushing into the Starship in, in Florida thing, but we've actually been working on this problem for maybe six or seven years now. Uh, and, you know, I see Janet's in the room here. I, you know, we, we stopped and started and stopped and started. And through our partnership with both NASA and the Space Force, you know, we cut no corners. We're doing the long environmental, environmental studies, and we're making sure that when we bring this rocket here, we're ready in a way that is um, helpful to the community and to the other operators. There is some fear. Oh, my God, Starship is going to shut down everything else that's happening at the Cape. That's not true. You know, sure, is it a big rocket? Yes, it's bigger than Falcon 9, bigger than Falcon Falcon Heavy. Actually, it's the world's biggest rocket ever built. Um, but we've done a lot of work to basically figure out how we shrink the impact. You know, SpaceX believes that the, the best spaceport is a spaceport that multiple provide, like, and not saying it will happen like this, but that multiple launch providers could launch multiple times a day. Like, we want to help the DOD and KSC design a spaceport where, you know, it's not just SpaceX, right? We want Blue Origin, we want Relativity, we want ULA, we want all these new entrants, we want Stoke to come in and be prosperous and be successful. And fundamentally, a spaceport is capable of handling that. Physics says it is. It's just how do we figure out how we work together and how we deconflict, and then actually go do some hard math and some hard engineering to make that happen. Um, I think we've got a really good plan. I think we've got a really good plan working with our partners. And it's going to be very, very exciting to, to watch the first launch of Starship from Florida.
It will be. Um, and I think it's also exciting from the NASA perspective what this will bring to the Artemis program as well and landing eventually our astronauts on the surface of the moon. Yeah, HLS is a huge, you know, the human landing system right, is a huge priority of ours. Uh, we got to help NASA achieve that goal of landing uh, on the surface of the moon, right? So we're on contract to basically uh, do a transfer of the astronauts from Orion once it's in lower orbit to, um, to a starship and then use the ship to actually go land on the surface of the moon. Um, you know, those techs will be, that tech will be really important and key and will, same stuff that it's going to take to achieve that goal is also going to enable the Mars goals, right? The big leap is you got to refuel on orbit, right? So this idea that you'll launch a ship and then you'll launch another ship and then you aggregate propellant, right? Um, and that lets you get enough energy to then you know, move a ship, do the entire landing sequence. But over time, that same exact architecture is like the, the needed game changer for actually sending a ton of stuff to Mars and having, being able to not just land, you know, um, a rover, but at, at land like, you know, a thousand tons, you know, a hundred, you know, many tons to the surface of Mars. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then, so with all, you, you've had some challenges, of course, but you know, we have something in our office that Janet has in her office that says you can do hard things. Space is incredibly hard. Um, it's probably the hardest thing that we're trying to achieve as human beings. So can you talk a little bit about like the iterations you've seen with, with Starship and with this next launch coming up as well? Yes, yes, no, I mean, the, we have definitely had some challenges in Starbase. Um, we've had some, a lot of successes. None of us, we thought it was real low likelihood we were gonna catch that booster on flight five. Um, but you know, SpaceX's approach is to fly and to test and to do, right? It's always been our approach. It's like, how do we, because you learn, rockets are, you could do a lot of analysis, you could do a lot of upfront design work, you could do a lot of things on paper, but until you fly the rocket, you don't learn. That's like the reality of the situation. And our process has always been that you learn the most through flight, so how do we get to that next flight as soon as possible? Um, and because we've been able to really develop Starship on our own, right, we've funded it, we've definitely got some funding from NASA for HLS, but the majority of the, the capital investment that is Starship has been SpaceX funded. And uh, because of that, we haven't necessarily had primary payloads on our, on our vehicles like we had on Falcon up front where like we were getting contracts, right? We've been able to really push the envelope to see like how do we develop this rocket iteratively and know that it's okay to fail. It's okay to break things as long as we're safe, you know, and are, are good stewards with, if we have a problem that we go handle our business, right, and clean up our business. As long as we do those things, right, we can learn this way and it's okay to fail. I, you know, I think people forget what the 60s were like and the 50s around here. Like, I don't know, I clearly wasn't around, but I see videos and I hear stories and there are a lot of failure happening when we we're really pushing, right? And uh, I think it, it is part of the process. You know, it's okay to fail if you can do it safely and, and no one gets hurt. Um, it's not cheap. Don't get me wrong, we don't like blowing up rockets. It's like not, it's not, it's certainly never a priority of ours. But every time that happens, we learn and we get better. And you know, never has there been a case where a rocket that has gonna have been at, at this size and at this scale that's been tested and flown as many times as it has will actually come to Florida for the first time. That's never happened. It's usually Florida is the test range, right? Like Florida is where like the new guy in Artemis, all these rockets, they launch here for the first time, right? Even Falcon, that's not gonna be the case with Starship. Starship, you're gonna get a vetted machine that shows up you know, ready to party. Well, thanks for sharing all yeah. of that, Kiko. Um, I think we're coming to the end of our time together, but we, I think we do have one last slide. Um, and I just want you to, if we, there we go, I want you to take a look at it. This is a cool picture, and I just want to hear from you what you think the next 20 years are going to look like in space exploration, and what does this mean to you? Yeah, you know, this kid, uh, this, this picture always means a lot to me, because I have two little kids. I have a three and a five-year-old. My five-year-old just started kindergarten at Freedom 7. So, um, you know, my kids were born in Cape Canaveral Hospital. hospital. Uh, the Cocoa Beach is their home. And um, we read Good Night. I grew up in Michigan, right? So they do read Good Night Michigan and Good Night Florida. Um, go blue for go anyone green. that's from. There's got to be some Midwest <laughs> people in this. Oh, no, there we go. Um, um, yay. Uh, in the back there. Um, 
Devin went to Michigan State, right? It's, oh, you know, ahead. it's like, but I, just, I, swear, okay. I swear there's a lot of Midwest implants in this town. So, um, which Janet is maybe too. why I like it. Yeah, so much. Um, so anyways, I, you know, I read to my kid and the idea that there's a future in which we are on Mars reading Goodnight Earth is like gives me all the feels. And um, I'm happy to be a part of it. You know, like I said, it's a true honor to work with the great humans in this community, uh, the great people, the great partners at NASA and the Space Force. And we're not going to let you down. We're going to do it right. And it's going to be a plus. So thank you guys for your time. It's your honor. Thanks, Pico.